I'm going to go over timely feedback with you guys during distance learning today. Hopefully give you some ideas and some tips and tricks on how to use your time wisely and get the feedback back to students without having to do a lot of work on your end in terms of, you know, a lot of typing, a lot of grading in terms of that. So hoping to show you guys a lot within this next hour. It will be an hour. Tonight or tomorrow morning, I'm going to send everything to you guys. So I will make sure that I give you guys all of the information that I'm going to show you today. So when I show you the PD module and other things, I don't want you guys to be like, well, I don't have that right now, but you will get it. Um, you'll be able to access it and, and, and have it for yourself so that you can have it for a while. At the very end, I'm going to have you do a feedback for Google form and then Joni Burkhart's going to come on and she's going to show you guys how to do your single sign on and actually sign and digitally sign um, for your uh, workshop. This is a one hour workshop. Once we go over everything, you do not have to do anything past that one hour. Just fill out the Google form and do your digital signature. So the first thing I'm going to do is go over the objectives. We're going to discuss hurdles and successes with timely feedback during distance learning. We're also going to survey several options for providing feedback. And then we're going to share learning moments and next steps. And then I'm going to have you complete the Google form and digital signature. What are some hurdles and successes you're encountering during distance learning concerning mm -hmm. timely feedback? Does anybody want to share some of their successes or their hurdles? Let's see if anybody's writing in the chat. Hurdles, slow internet. Mm-hmm. Amount of students longer to type versus speak. We are going to talk about some speaking options that you can use. So that definitely will help you. I don't have the slow internet option, but like I do understand that that is a barrier, especially when you're trying to do stuff. We had that many years ago and we finally got it all fixed. Well, we had to just with the work that I do and the kids and everything and all the devices. So that was huge for us go back to the chat, sorry. Also being able to edit, mark up a, a document without the slow upload in Google Classroom, okay. Uh, students prefer to do work on weekends or outside the work day, and the amount of clicks to look at students' math work on Google Classroom assignments, okay. Um, and, okay. And also the other group said too they had a lot of kids doing the work late or turning it in on the weekend after it's graded on friday um so that they're constantly in this makeup work too and this is i've had success with giving a lot of feedback on google docs i use the comment bank for most assignments yeah we're going to talk about that today having to give feedback for the first week when you are in week four Okay, and understood. I was an English teacher for 24 years, and I usually had about 133 papers to grade at a time, and I used to have them all in a bag or bags, um, and I would be, you know, bringing them home and taking them back. Uh, students and parents expect feedback instantly since we are digital, and I do agree with that. And being a parent of two, I can understand what you guys are saying with the times. My daughter eight o'clock in the morning she's sitting next to me at the table she's eight and she's like ready to go and she wants to be done within two or three hours because she wants the rest of the day to herself she says so she knows that getting done early she has the rest of the day to herself my son he's 15 he'll get up at 11 or 12 he'll get to work at 12 or 1 he'll work for three hours and then he has his work done both of them get their work done just in their own time so i completely get that part too and then let me see i'm a co-teacher in multiple classrooms so i had to go turn off notifications and i see that yeah a lot of uh, times that is a contention with co-teaching some of the elementary schools, they decided to do more of a Google form. And when a student is finished with an assignment, they'll turn it in in the Google form so that they show. Um, Kim's coming in right now. She is the person that's 
sort of co-teaching, sort of not. She's in between the two classes. We split this class into two. We did secondary versus elementary. Elementary has standards-based grading and a lot of things that feedback looks a little different for them. So that is why we're doing that. So could you guys do me a favor in the chat right now since Kim is here, can you just type in your name and your school? She's going to take a role right now and just see who's here and who is not. I think pretty much everybody is here that I had on my list. So Kim's just going to check everybody. And just in case she would miss somebody or if your name um, comes up a little differently, she doesn't have to try to figure out who you are. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and start with the first thing. I am going to start with Screencast of High and Flipgrid. Both of these we had people say that they have or have not used it. I'm just going to show you Screencastify, but for those of you that have used Flipgrid, you could do the same because it does have a Screencast feature now. Screencastify is five minutes. Flipgrid, you can go up to 10 minutes, but you will see, and I just want to show you this chart, um, studies do show that with student engagement with streaming videos, Basically, you have them at but probably like one to six minutes. It starts to go down the more that you have where you're talking. Uh, we have a WCPS repository of videos. If we have people talking on the videos, most of the time, the average time that somebody stays on a video and watches it is two and a half to three minutes. So that's why our, our videos are about five minutes long and no more because we want to make sure that they at least get to see the gist of what they needed to see. If they see what they understood and then they click off of it, great. They at least figured out how to do the actual app or whatever we have the video pertaining to. So that's something to keep in mind. In order to get Screencastify, I'm on a MacBook right now, you can go to Chrome Web Store once you're on Chrome Web Store, you're just going to type in Screencastify. I have rate it because I, I already have it, so you're going to add it to Chrome. When you click Add to Chrome, you can close this out. And then when you click the three dots while you're in Chrome, you're going to see Screencastify is going to look like this little arrow. You're going to click on it, and this is going to pop up. The first time, you're going to sign on. You can use your Google single sign-on. They're gonna ask you, can they have access to your microphone? You're gonna say yes. They're gonna ask, can I have access to your webcam? And you're gonna say yes to that as well. I'm using a headset right now. So this was what I would choose, but you can also choose whichever microphone you wanna use if you're using different things. You always wanna choose desktop instead of browser tab, because if I choose browser tab, I will only be able to show you this Google slide. I won't be able to go to any of these other tabs up here if I want to show you something as an example, let's say. And you can embed the webcam, so the webcam would be here. If you do webcam only, you're just showing your face, but if you do embed webcam, that's where you would have on the corner there. Once you do desktop, you'll hit record, and then what you see here is your entire screen or application window. So we want to click entire screen. When I hit share, it's going to do a three, two, one. And then I can go to anywhere I want to. It's recording right now. This is an article that my uh, son ha had to read for art and he had to write down some facts. So I just pulled this up. You have some mouse features over here. I can actually do a focus mouse, so if I want them just to look at a certain area while I'm recording, I could show them that. You also have, for this pointer, you have the hide cursor when not moved. Oops, sorry, I have to click off the other one first. Hide cursor when not moved, but when you hold down on it, you're going to be able to do that. That's what I like sometimes when I'm showing somebody how to open up something, it actually circles it for you. The other one is pretty similar. It says highlight clicks. So then you would just getting the clicks highlighted as you're, as you're using them. Um, you can also use the pen. You can change it to different colors and then you can underline, you can circle, and you can show the students what you're talking about. 
when you're over here, you can erase, but also down here on the left, you can pause this and then you can move it up and down. You go back on your pointer, move it up and down and then go back and play it again so that you can change it. You would erase your marks and then go to the next thing. Um, remember with Screencastify, you only have five minutes, but that's plenty to chunk the information for the student. Afterwards, when I'm done, I'm gonna move this out of the way so you guys can see there's a thing called Stop Sharing. I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna to go to a screen that looks like this. I can go ahead and click and unmute and hear myself, but I can also, um, I can pause it. I have up here, do you see where I'm circling? It says copy shareable link. If I click that, it's gonna tell me when it's copied and I can actually share that link with the student directly in Google Classroom. You can do it here as well, but the problem is, is it goes in as a comment to the student, like a private comment, and it doesn't have a lot of uh, substance to it. It might not be in a certain way that you want it to be, so it's easier to go into Google Classroom and to get that. If you ever need to go to your recordings for Screencastify, you just click on it and click on these dot, these lines here and you'll see my recordings and you'll be able to find everything that you have in there. So do we have any questions on Screencastify? Let me look here. Okay, now Kristen, you can do, you can do screen sharing on the iPad. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write that down and I will put the screen sharing on the iPad directions for all of you that have the teacher iPad with you. I'll put that on the email that I'm going to send you guys either tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay, so that you guys have that. But yes, you, the students can do it and you can do it as well. It's really nice to have that option too. And you can, when you're doing the screen sharing, you can bring the students work up in either like Google Classroom because you have the little pencil feature um, and you can go ahead and edit on there and then just, you know, not hit save and you would have the recording there. And again, you can do it with Flipgrid as well. It's more advanced, so I'm not gonna go over it. And yes, you can edit the video if you want to share just a portion of it. Just have to click edit whenever it comes up at the very end there, after it downloads and everything, you'll see the added options. And it's very intuitive. Um, I'll just go in and show you guys real quick. I'll go to one of my recordings that I just did. And if I click on this one and I open an editor. So let's say I wanted to like, just stop it right here and, and uh, all I would do is just cut it. And then I could decide what I wanted to do with this part. I could go ahead and delete it or whatever. So it's very nice. Um, you can do all kinds of different trims and you could put text in and different things as well. And then you would have a different recording for that. So it does have the editor as well. Did that help? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, the next thing is with Google Classroom, and I have this funny like organization because tomorrow we're teaching how to organize Google Classroom, so it looks horrendous, so <laughs> I'm sorry, but it does make sense for what I'm doing. Um, but down here, I have an assignment. I've already have the students turned it in. I only have one student in this class, uh, but the main thing here is instead of clicking, because I used to click on the actual number of how many people turned it in, and I wouldn't click down here because it wasn't available for me when I first started using Google Classroom. But if you click on view assignment, so it's right here in the bottom left, and you click on the actual student, you're gonna have a plethora of different things that you can do grading wise. So it comes up a little bit differently than just clicking on the student. The first thing you're gonna notice is you can go up here and either edit or suggest. Whenever I used to edit for students, if I did a highlight and told them what needed to be changed, it could change it for them automatically. So I usually suggested 
so that they would have to go in and actually do the changes. Another thing I could do is if I want to, because I did copy that link, if I want to say, see this video about PDFs, I can go ahead and put the link here and comment. And the student can then click on that and go straight to it. But another thing for the private comments, and I was saying this, is if you want to use the private comments so that it doesn't look garbled like here, you can definitely add some of the information, like if you could say, let's cap lock this second heading, and then say, this is where I want you to watch the video about this, and then post. The students will be able to go back, and I'm gonna try this. Sometimes when I go between, can you guys still see? This is what the student sees. This is their assignment. So when they're in here, the students can see this, and then they can actually see the comments down here, and it becomes a little bit more focused because you have that and it's actually in bold so they can see it. Um, another thing you can do is instead of just private comments, you have a comment bank right here. You would click on this and you would go to add to bank if you wanted to. And what's nice is this comment bank stays with you from one assignment to the other. So if I went into the next assignment and I opened up the comment bank, all these comments would be there. And so I can use them from assignment to assignment to assignment. And that's why you have this little search box here because eventually you're gonna be like, where's my conclusion, you know, once. And there's one that says, add something that will conclude your essay better, then you can find it and you can use it. And to use the actual comment, you just click on the three dots you copy it to your clipboard and you either bring it out here or you bring it down to, and this is to go back to the grading, to the paper, you can bring it down to the comments and then under conclusion, you can say, add something that will conclude your essay better. And then it's more organized for the students and they can see those comments, the private comments, and they can see the that you have the comments. And I would say as an English teacher for 24 years, I found that a lot of times I had the same thing I was saying over and over again to the students. So by having that comment bank, then I would have some choice and some variety. And I could even, if I wanted to, have my comment bank organized in such a way where I had things sort of bolded. So if I said conclusion, and then I went ahead and put something like be sure to include a restatement of the thesis and then add it. When I add it, I'm gonna start seeing these big bolded areas here and then I'm gonna be able to find, oh, those are my conclusion ones, those are my introductory or whatever you're using, you know, depending upon what you're, what you're discussing with the students so that they get to see those comments. I saw a couple chats down here, so I just wanna check this chat. Can you edit the video if you need to shorten it? Yes, and then you have that option after you're done recording. Uh, I have also found when I'm putting the comment on the Google Doc, I do not even have to go to the comment bank. I just have to type in the word. Okay, um, and that's something that the comment bank was never there for me, so that's really awesome. And I did hear about the hashtag and typing the hashtag in front of your comment, and then it will automatically fill as well. So yeah, you, don't, you don't even need the hashtag anymore. It just okay. shows up. Okay. So, which is really nice. I, you just, I just am like, oh, this is about the men. Like this question was about the men, and I know I have a comment for the men, so I put in the word men, and it just shows up below it, and I just put it in. Okay. So like here, if I would just put like thesis... Ah, nice. And then don't I even just have to go back and deal with it. It's so nice. Nice. Okay, so I've learned something. So that's awesome. I always like to learn something while I'm teaching. I was reading that and I even tried the hashtag, but guess where I was trying the hashtag? Over here. I was like, well, that's not working. <laughs> so I see now how it's working. I get it. Okay, but that's very nice. 
I wish they would have had that when I was doing all that grading of all my papers. And then again, if you go back here, you can always change the grade so that it's worth, you know, a certain number of points. I don't think you can do half points quite yet. Um, but again, you see here, I made it so that it's worth the amount of points out of my rubric. So I made my rubric down here. So I'm going to just talk about that also. You can definitely add a rubric. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. You can then see it while you're looking at just to know like what you're you're talking about and what the, the full points was if you need to see. Um, it doesn't show all of it, but it's enough for you to remember, oh yeah, I was talking about use of color or needs, you know, a little bit more, color is off, color is distracting, you know, more work is needed. So in order to do that, I'm going to go into another assignment because once you do a rubric, you cannot change it once things are turned in by a student. So you have to do the rubric ahead of time, which I like because that gives the students a heads up. This is what the rubric's about, you know? So let's go to an assignment and edit it. You can edit any assignment to add a rubric and you just click on rubric right here. You can reuse a rubric. You can import a rubric from sheets or you can create a rubric. You can have descending or ascending depending upon your preference. If you like it to go from one to five or five to one, you can always change it. If you say, oh, I did it one to five, but now I want it five to one, you can always change it and we'll flip flop it around for you. You put your criterion title. So you put something like style. You could say, you know, style of artwork. And then you would put the level title. So that would be the thing that shows up for you whenever you're grading on the side there. So if you want to say something like uh, mood and color, and then the description a little bit more down here. And then just to add another part of that rubric, you just do it here and you choose how many points. So you could have it go one, two, or you could have it go two, four, six, eight, like whatever the increments that you want. Um, you can add a criterion. So that would be like another part of the rubric. So this is the part one, then you would add another one and so on and so forth and you would build it. Once you save it, then it's going to let them know the rubrics there and how many points it is and how many criterions are there. They can click on the rubric and see it prior to actually doing the assignment. And it just gives some feedback to the students of, this is what I'm gonna focus on. Um, because not everything has to be completely graded. You can say to the students, I am going to have you do this assignment but the main focus of the grading is gonna be on this. And you're gonna give them something to focus on with that. I saw something coming up on the chat. Oh, you can do half points now, that's good. The other day I was trying to do half points, and it was like, no. So maybe it was just being wonky there, okay. The, you know, the main thing with these, if you see with the rubric and you save this, when you go in and you actually grade the assignment, it just makes it so much nicer in terms of feeling like you don't have to do a lot of the comments, like they were saying, you know, some of the students can't see the comments on the iPad as well as they could see it on like a desktop. I used to take my students to the library so they could actually see the comments correctly. You might wanna use a rubric instead in the private comments as a way to communicate with the students. Um, a little bit more. So are there any questions on Google Classroom? Because I, I just want to make sure everybody understands how that works and how that functions um, and that you can get to those. Um, another thing too, I really like this. Um, I'm going to send this out to you. It is a part about formative assessment and distance learning and just talking about it but it has this man talking about rules for critique. And I'm gonna just play it for you guys so you can see it. I'm gonna unplug my headsets. I used to have about 10 rules for critique, but nobody could remember them. <laughs> so um, finally, after using 10 forgettable rules for 10 years or whatever, 
I was, I got critique on my presentations and on my work, which was good, sharp, smart critique that enabled me to cut that down to the three most important things. Be kind, be specific, be helpful. And there are certainly other pointers you could give someone. Use I statements, start with the positive before you use critical things, you know, um, ask things as a question rather than a definitive statement. There's lots of guidelines that used to be part of my 10. But now when I walk into a kindergarten, kids will say, oh, I know you, you're the kind, specific, helpful guy, right? You're that, that we use those rules. People really do remember those rules. It, it's very simple. But to see them in, in practice, um, Imagine, uh, Michelle, that you're in a ballet class as a kid or as an adult, and you're in a position. The teacher's going to walk by you, put her hand gently on your shoulder, and say, Michelle, your shoulders are just right. It's exactly right. Being kind. But look at your back leg. Okay, do you see, if you could move that back leg just a little bit more to get yourself in a line here, think of how different that's going to be. Now, try that. See how different that is? Okay, concentrate on that next time you take that position. And then she walks on to the next person. And then you think, I felt good about that. She was complimentary, but I know exactly what I was doing wrong. It was specific and helpful. And the next time I'm in that position, I'm going to be just right here. Basically, I liked what he was saying about like being kind, you know, be to the point and be helpful. That is something that I think um, we can do, especially during this time, is for the timely feedback is to make sure that we don't have to grade everything, but what we do grade, we give the students some positive comments, as well as some tips to make it better so that they know that they did well on one area or one aspect, but I really think it was gonna be like off the charts if you do this. So they start to see that that is gonna make it just so much better. Also, like I said, you can pick that focus area, but you also can have students grade one another. Um, one of the things that I used to do is a shared Google Doc or Google Slide. Google Slides work really well for a big group of students. I would say to them, you know, each of you have this number, and I would tell them, I would have a list, this is your number, whatever number's there, that's your number of slide. And they would go to the slide, they would do the work, whatever they had to show me. And then I would tell number four that they had to critique number eight and so on and so forth. And if they didn't have room on a slide, they made a new slide underneath, they put their name at the top and they critiqued on what the person was doing. And they did something that was very similar. So I'm gonna be giving you guys this. This actually has a PD module I went over my using Screencastify for feedback. You'll get a video on that. You'll get the video on using Google Classroom and written directions and some of the ideas here. But one of the things is the sentence starters part right here with students. I like this because it's very simple. It's called tag. You tell your peers something you like positive. You ask a question and allow to ask the question about anything you're curious about after reading the other students' work or seeing their you know, problem or anything that they did, like, how did you do that? And then G, giving the writer a positive suggestion. And then down here, they actually give some sentence starters. Anytime I gave sentence starters to my students, they loved it because they didn't know how to approach or say something to somebody, um, but they loved it that they could start the sentence and then continue on and say something and it just it gave them some pointers and some tips on what to say and again if you're worried about kids saying something incorrectly on a google slide remember on any google document you have the revision history so go to the revision history and you're going to know exactly who wrote what where you'll just be able to see if they've put something in, usually once they know you can see all of those editing marks, sometimes I used to show the kids, you know, we'd all be working on it together and I'd be like, now look, look what so-and-so said. How did you know I said that? Well, look at the revision history. And then they knew I could see it. They didn't even try because they were like, okay, she, she's figured it out, she knows. But this might be a way also to do that. And again, we have a lot of these different things for you guys to see and look at at the end. 
end. Um, Alice Keeler here talks about feedback with Google Slides and some of her ideas are similar and some of them are a little bit differently. Um, this one I just found today about everything you should know about screencasting. That's where I got that chart from. And it also talked about how it shouldn't be that long of a screencast to chunk things for your students so that they can see an area, they can listen to what you have to say, digest that, and then perhaps go to the next area so that you have that, so the students can actually see that. But if you do where the students are grading um, each other and critiquing one another, then you're not grading per se, you know, what they need to improve upon. What you're looking at is, did so-and-so help the other person? And if not, how can I add to that? So you would add to it perhaps for the student and say, I liked what your partner said. I would also just add this. And you're not putting everything in because you have somebody that's helped you with that. And the more that you have the students do this critiquing of one another, you'll notice that you won't have to, and if they use those sentence stars, you won't have to worry about coming up with all of that on your own and all the feedback on your own because they're going to be helping you along with that. Um, I did see something coming up in the chat, so I'm gonna just check it again. Yes, and they are great supports, Georgine, for EL students too, especially not knowing how to start something off, uh, a sentence. And again, you know, having them just to know that they can use those, um, and if you have it in a Google form, then they can translate that as well. And then I will review the web-based resources and share them with the fellow teacher friends. Um, but thank you, Kim, for reminding me. <laughs> Anything else that you guys wanna say about this part where I was talking about cr the kids critiquing one another or pick a, picking a focus area, not grading everything? Lisa, I really do think that when the students learn to correctly peer edit each other's papers, they also become much better writers in the process of doing that. Right, and they have an authentic audience. It's just not you, the same person that's looked at it how many other times in the course of the year. It's somebody that could be random. You could just team them up with whomever in the class. And so sometimes they'll work a little bit harder or they'll make it where it's more of a, you know, I don't know who's gonna look at my work. I, I, I actually used to, with my colleague Kim Jennifer and I, we used to have our classes grade one another. So we actually had them critique other classes so they never knew if sometimes their own classmates were gonna look or another class that was doing the same thing was gonna look. So that even opted a little bit more because that authentic audience became somebody that might not be even somebody you know, but in another class. Um, I saw something was added to the chat. Oh, good, so you found the same in music. Uh, yeah, I mean, they really, they care about what each other think, um, believe it or not. I see that with my own children as well. Um, another thing that I have on the teacher website, and I just wanted to show you guys this um, because I know you're overwhelmed, but we have under teacher professional development as well as K through 12 resources. You can find it both there. We have a button that's called digital capacity resources. We have a list of all the resources with PD modules. We have the Flipgrid one here. Flipgrid now has screencasting. If you go on the Flipgrid PD module at the very bottom, you're gonna see that I have a one minute, 29 second video showing you how to screencast with Flipgrid and what button you need to press. And it acts just like Screencastify. It does the three, two, one countdown. It's just 10 minutes of recording. And that would be if you're feeling like you need a little bit more time to explain something, especially if you're doing a full group video versus an individualized video. Sometimes you might wanna do a video to the entire class, have that video, because sometimes I felt like I was saying the same thing over and over again to students, have that video and then just place it in when you need it. Have it off to the side or in your comment bank so that you have it 
for that assignment. And there's different ones here. We try to explain each one, try to give you some ideas on how it could be used and when it can be used. And we're really trying to think distance learning at this time so that you can go through them and you can see them. Um, I know in the last workshop that we had just prior to this, somebody said Google Forms, and I totally agree. That's really great for feedback too, especially if you make it a quiz where you have students um, answer questions and they get to see how many they got correct. Um, also, branching Google Forms, if you can do a branching quiz where they answer a question and if they get it right, they move on to the next one. If they get it wrong, they get some sort of support and scaffolding. And those are really interesting too to do as well. We have all of these on our digital capacities that work really well for immediate feedback. I know that sometimes I wanted, you know, I, I know somebody said in this um, session that they were having parents and students wanted things back really quickly. All of these will get really quick results back to the students. It will let them know how they're doing. And what I did with all of these when I used to teach is I would leave them open so that the students could take them over and over and over and over again. And so it wasn't really a grade, but it was more of a practice. And once they showed me that they had practiced enough and gotten a certain uh, point value, then they might have gotten some points for that, but they wouldn't get a zero if they took it for the first time and it wasn't locked because like they went back and they learned something. Sometimes I had to make a flipped lesson for them for that so that they would understand. So it's one of those things where you can use these for feedback for yourself as well. Where are you going to go next with the students? And so you might say to them, when we do these types of things, I'm looking for feedback for me. I'm not going to put a grade per se, but I need to see where you're struggling. Um, and then kids understand that, that sometimes um, I always try to equate it to athletics. You're always doing more work trying to better yourself, continuing to practice. You just don't become an Olympic athlete or a, you know, a college athlete or um, you know, pro athlete overnight. It's all the practice and all the conditioning that you do in order to get better. So the students understood all the practice that we did on one thing, why we were doing it. We were trying to get better. Let me see, I saw a few comments pop up here. Yeah, the 10 minutes would be good for a CT doing AutoCAD drawings. Um, Flipgrid, it's usually five, but they made it 10 during distance learning, and I bet they're going to have trouble making it go back to five after they've given us 10. Um, somebody else said for public speaking also, the 10 minutes will be nice because they have to do a 30-minute speech uh, for HCC, but they're going to break it into three natural places that they have to break it into so the students understand you know, time constraints. So I thought that was good too. I'll put something in. I'm gonna write down about branching Google Forms. And I'll say that was something that somebody had asked. And I will put in my resources. I have several resources on branching Google Forms. And I believe if you go to the WCPS, go to the employee portal, professional learning, and you go under teachers, and you go to professional learning videos, and you go to Google, and then Google Forms once it loads. So Google Forms, I think at the very bottom, I do have that as one of the resources under here. Yep, Alice Kaler making branching quizzes 2019. So I do have that there as well, but I have some other ones too that I'll put in there but that's where you can find it if you need to look at it right now. I'm gonna put this in the chat. This is in case you don't have your phone to scan. You can go ahead and do this feedback form. I'm gonna mute myself. Now, somebody did um, share the code for the uh, Screencastify. We're trying to say not to do that, and the only reason why is any sort of new like um, codes that they're giving for premium packages, eventually you're gonna have to go back to the freemium <laughs> um, or pay for it. 
So we're trying to say not to use it, plus for Screencastify, five minutes should be your limit. Um, when doing any sort of video, when you're flipping something, teaching something, um, just to remind you, um, I always watch my time just because I don't want to go over. So it's better to scaffold and chunk if you can. Oh, it says, what does it mean when it says, how will we follow up? How are you going to maybe use this in your classroom? How are you going to follow up if you need any questions? Are you going to contact us? Are you going to go and, you know, look at the, the resources that we're sending you, that type of thing, so that we know how you would normally follow up on things? We are going to continue some of these sessions for anybody out there. If you know people who wanted to come to a session and did not get in, we are going to offer um, another session next week from in the morning for people who report late to work. And uh, I will have all of that information out probably Tuesday afternoon, I would say. Here's our goal. We want to help you out and we are not going to overwhelm you. I do not want to put professional learning in front of you that feels like it is just more like, oh my gosh, I have to learn more. I have to do more. This is just in time. This is something that you're already doing. We do not want you to go in and switch everything up, but we might want you, th these are tools that might help you, help your students, help your parents. So we're going to continue with that theme. If you have ideas about some PD that you would like to have, um, please let us know. The one thing that, you know, I want you guys to know is, you know, do what you feel comfortable with, but also, you know, do what something that would allow your students to also shine and show their work as well. If you need any help, we are here to help you. You can just check with us. Well, have a wonderful evening. Enjoy yourselves. I will send you out something as soon as like my brain regenerates. I will definitely make sure to send something out to you guys at some point with all the resources and all the um, information that you can then go ahead and keep for yourself. Hey, and we do want to say thanks to, we know this is not what anybody expected. We appreciate all of the work that you do, all of the work that you're doing with the students, with the, with the parents. We, like, we know it's not what you signed up for and you guys have just done wonderfully. So thank you so much. Agreed. Thank you. In order to access the PD module shown in this video, please scan the QR code or use the shortened URL.